Hey guys, it's CL, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I make brand new Critical Role recaps every Monday at noon, and would be happy to have you join the party. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe and hit the Bertrand bell to be notified of future videos. Now, without further ado, let's discuss the 71st episode of Campaign 3 of Critical Role. The episode begins as our heroes land on one of the fog-filled islands of the Shattered Teeth. Gaining their bearings, Imogen tries to send a message to Jorana to let her know they're coming, but it fails. Seems like the magic is fucky-wucky here too. To get a better vantage point, Imogen and Orem fly high above the fog cloud and see something terrifying. A long serpent-like creature moving through the cloudscape, and through a perception check they can tell it's at least a hundred feet long. No thanks. Deciding to keep low with Pass Without a Trace, they search for a bit before they make camp, and they encounter some small fuchsia and teal creatures that resemble firebugs. They're almost like frogs in appearance and are easily startled, especially after the group hear a strange reverberating sound from nearby. Laudna sends Pate to scout invisibly, but doesn't find anything, except for a large four-toed footprint that they're standing in. Uh-oh. Fern makes a fort out of the Entangle spell, and Chetney shows off his Hemocraft ability that allows him to seek info on the area. And he can tell it's very predatory, that someone's gotta eat, and someone's gonna be eaten. Also, the only two in the party that have dark vision are Chetney and Laudna. How did I not realize that no one had dark vision? So the party split watches with those who can actually see through the pitch black fog cover and letters takes up the final watch because, I mean, robotic eyes, maybe that's better. FCG actually tries to speak with one of the frog fairies as their watch ends and they end up casting tongues on it and oh, I love these little guys. They actually have some info too besides being cute. The weird reverberating sound, it's a geyser nearby. Nothing to worry about there. They do warn of the smelly one, a camouflaged creature with a good sense of smell, and it turns out the teal color they sport isn't their natural color. It masks their smell, it's their shit. But they mention Taurus, a being around here that's the only one who lives here and helps save them from the smelly one. FCG presses about how to get Taurus' attention, and the adorable little creatures tell them, fire, which is something that they are apparently obsessed with. After the party wakes up, they make a deal with the flighty frog fairies. In exchange for a fire show, they get a shit show to help hide their scent. However, once they get atop a plateau so they don't catch the trees nearby a fire, they end up drawing the attention of the creature anyway with the noise of the fireball extravaganza, and man, it's scary. Somewhere between Mole and Komodo Dragon with camo powers, it has a high perception and notices Chetney despite being decently stealthed. And it does 62 points of a critical bite. Ow! As combat starts, Imogen summons a Relora, and FCG compels it to move away from Chet. However, the spell sadly doesn't last long as it passes a wisdom save. Orem gets hard with nearly 60 points in damage taken from two hits, which Ladna Silvery barbs is to save Orem from taking that crit as well. He probably would have just been out. They hear a heavy impact in the distance and are soon joined by a gargantuan toad-like creature with bulbous yellow eyes. Taurus has appeared and is able to fling the chameleon creature, which is called a Barim Bandalo, or lovingly known as Barry Manilow by Sam, the child of the reef serpent, out to sea. Things settle down and Taurus opens his mouth and inside is a house. Within its stomach is a lantern-lit living room and out walks a turtle person, or a galapa, who ends up being Jorana. She welcomes them inside for tea and they learn a lot about the Shattered Teeth. Here's the rundown. 1. The frog fairies are called Dulabos. 2. The serpent thing we saw is the Cloud Jaws, or a sky whale. It's best not to be messed with. They like to eat sky ships that pass through on accident. 3. She's 130-ish years old, Though calendars are apparently different in the rest of Exandria, and she's more like 400. 4. The islands move. They don't stay in the same place. Since their creation, there's been a churning elemental energy since the Titans were destroyed that keeps them nomadic. While she doesn't know about the Hishari of Ashton's past, we also learn some more about the Galgrishari of Von Trevere. He planted himself as a tree during the creation of the Shattered Teeth and became a memory of sacrifice, a vessel of sadness for others, and it's one of the few windows between life and death. 
It lies between worlds and can sometimes know the path to those who wish to know their death. Though she can't go with them, this is her home, she's somewhere between collector and hoarder as she gifts them a map with the island of Kalutha's most recent location listed, that she got from a crashed ship. She also gives them a couple safe transportation recommendations, like trade ship, there's like certain boats they can take, before they decide on the dangerous one. Using the lost compass of the dread captain Novos, a terror that hailed from Wildmount, they can meet the ghost captain of a ghost ship, and maybe he will sail them to Kalutha. Their crew is seeking the wealths that they've lost when their ship was attacked, and Chet uses his hemocraft to see the ship being ambushed and watches a dwarf make a curse to the sky as a bolt hits him straight in the forehead, and his lips pull into a smile as the vision goes dark. Jirana also gifts them reef moss balms, potions of sort. One is a slick shimmer oil, easier to get away from grapple and deflect attacks. Another, a cleansing flame that helps heal ailments, as well as burns people. Curious about that one. And two greater healing potions. As they're leaving, FCG confides that they don't feel helpful. And looking into their eyes, Jorana can see he holds deep grief. And that they have to let others help them too. And that the tree might bring them guidance. She gifts Chet Viagra. And also, Ashton pulls the Galapa aside to ask, How do you grieve if you don't know what was taken from you? Damn, Talison and these juicy lines. She tells them to try to concentrate on what you've gained since then. It only weighs as much as you give it. Everything can be fixed with time. Which is funny coming from her, since as they use Taurus to jump towards the ghost ship on the beach, they're surrounded by her falling and breaking junk all around the toad cabin. I love her and hope that we come back and see her soon. Tell me your thoughts on Yvonne Trevere in the comments. I'm curious if he'll be able to not only shed light on Ashton and FCG, but more about Vax and maybe how to free him. Hopefully they also hold the answer to how to stop lewdness once and for all. Don't forget to like and subscribe and check out my recaps of Campaign 3 on my channel if you haven't gotten caught up yet. Also, I put out an EP last Friday and it would mean a lot to me if you guys went and listened to it. It's on all streaming platforms. Thank you so much for watching. Stay safe out there. Good day, my friends.